Today we're heading 20 miles north of San Diego to the small town of Rancho Santa Fe. While there, let's figure out what a 95-year-old store has in common with trees from Australia, a railroad and its failed experiment, and a lady architect from National City. Let's start with the trees. Australian gum trees to be exact, they're also known as eucalyptus trees, and they were imported from Australia to America more than 150 years ago. These exotic trees were valued for their fast growth, drought tolerance, and interesting foliage. Well, from 1906 to 1914, the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe Railway Company planted over 3 million of these eucalyptus trees on 3,000 acres of land in the area we now know as Rancho Santa Fe. They were hoping to use these fast-growing trees for cross ties used in railroad tracks. Alas, the experiment failed, mostly because though these trees were amazingly fast-growing, they wouldn't be strong enough for the task at hand until the trees were closer to 75 years. But since that portion of San Diego County is known as the Avocado Belt, a developer came up with the brilliant idea of developing a community of, of gentlemen ranchos. In, these would be impressive estates where orange and avocado trees could increase freight for the trains to transport. And that's how Rancho Santa Fe came to be. And now about that lady architect. Well, Lillian Rice was born in 1889 in National City. That's just south of San Diego. She received her architecture degree from UC Berkeley in 1910 and she would become the 10th woman in California to get an architectural license. She worked in the firm of Requa and Jackson, where she was lead architect for the new community of Rancho Santa Fe, designing predominantly in the Spanish colonial revival style, which would contribute to that style's predominance in Southern California. Lillian Rice is considered an early environmental architect focusing on finding harmony between a structure and its natural surroundings. To tell us more about Lillian Rice, I'd like to welcome Diane Welch, who has written two books on Lillian Rice. She has become the foremost expert and biographer of Lillian's life and work. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You did a lot of research on the life of Lillian Rice. Can you talk about some of the more important aspects that you found about her? Um, I think one of the most important things was that she's a multi-talented woman. She was musical, she could ride, um, she played tennis, she was very active, very athletic, she liked to go hiking, um, and she was a really good actress. <laughs> and I think the other thing was that, um, you know, she was exceptional, she broke through the glass ceiling um, before it was even a thing, and she really held her own with her peers who were primarily male. Um, she did give opportunity to both male and female architects and designers. So, you know, I, I think looking at her as an ind individual as a whole, she's multifaceted. And I think it's important to remember that she's not just an architect, but that she had a lot of talent and creativity and then, you know, humanity to support other people too. So Lillian was hired by Richard Requa in the early 1920s to work in the firm Requa and Jackson. It sounds like they shared an appreciation for or the Spanish colonial revival style. So what do you know about her relationship with Richard Reckla? Was he a mentor or just a boss? How, how did they interact? He was her boss. Um, she did work as an associate in his, you know, his practice. Um, he was, I think, nine years his senior, which is the same age spread as Jack, her brother. Um, so I think he was more like a brotherly figure to her, certainly would have been a mentor, but treated her as an equal. You know, she was extremely capable in what she did. And when Richard Requa did get the commission to do Rancho Santa Fe, the plate was already full. And, he, you know, he happily, from what I can gather, um, passed over the whole project to Lillian Rice. She was a resident supervisory architect up there. So I think her relationship with Requa is that he trusted her and treated her as an equal. Um, and, and as I say, age-wise was more of a brother, brotherly figure to her. You write that when Lillian was at Berkeley, she was a member of the Hillside Club, an organization of architects and women homeowners. They held a steadfast belief that buildings should be subservient to the land. I love their maxim that a home was Landscape gardening with a few rooms to use in case of rain. Yeah, I know. I smiled when I, I saw that. And most of our homes in Rancho Santa Fe followed those principles where 
um, the building was subservient to the site, she would follow the lay of the land, she would not grade, grade the land. And they tended to be, you know, low and kind of following the terrain. Um, and the whole indoor, outdoor um, living space was, you know, it, that was new, that was innovative at that time. And, and the homes would always have like a sleeping porch um, because that was when, you know, to be outside was to be healthy. You know, it's, again, it was very au courant, is able to enjoy the outdoors and have the outdoors be an extension of the indoors of the home and vice versa. Anything beside, behind the design or history of the Joer's Ketchum store? Um, so she did, she traveled to Spain um, in 1925. She, she went on the behest of the railroad company, the Atchison, Topeka, Santa Fe Railroad Company. So she went out to Spain to see, you know, firsthand the architecture out there. Um, she was actually in Tarifa, Spain, which is in, in the south of Spain. It's a very historic city with lots of little winding streets. Um, but she did photograph a lot. She probably sketched. And then she brought those ideas back into Rancho Santa Fe. So if that's at the time when we get the row houses were designed and we get the Joe's Ketchum, it's a mixed use. So residential on the top and then the bottom was a store. I think the hallmarks of Lillian Rice's design that may set her apart from the people was the restraint of decoration. It seems such a shame that she should die so young when her business was still in its prime. Um, I, I agree that she probably died too young. And we think of her as being very young right now. She's actually 40, 49, which back then was not considered very young. But she remained busy you know, throughout her whole time uh, as a, a licensed architect and uh, was certainly very, very prolific, very, very busy right through until the end. Diane, thank you so much for bringing the life and work of this talented architect back into the light for us all to appreciate and to learn from. Today we're drawing our building from an old photograph because I just can't find that building on a sunny day without a car parked in front. And while every urban sketcher has had that problem, we really want to admire this building. So let's use this photo from 1991. Spanish colonial revival architecture is actually very simple architecture that originated in Spain where the climate is very similar to what we have here in Southern California. Sunny days, usually warm, not that much rain. Look at these fascinating corbels. I've seen Lillian Rice use these on several buildings and consider it a signature of hers. I want to do a quick overlay to show you where we're going today before we get started. This store that we're drawing has a two-story portion. It's definitely boxy. You can't see much of the roof. It has a one-story portion next to it. We can see a little more of that roof. The punched openings are simple. There's no ornamentation around the opening. There are the two doors. This is the window. This boxy window. There's some delicate wrought iron for the railing. And then on the one por story portion, it's a similar thing. And so our sketch is, is really going to be some rectangles. It'll be a play of light and dark. Pretty simple. One thing that we are going to add that really isn't in the photo that we're copying from, there's a little tree right here. We're going to make our tree a little bigger. And of course, it'll be a eucalyptus tree that we've talked about. And that's the gist of our simple sketch. Grab your pencil, uh, number two or softer will do. We'll start with the bigger form first. It's a rectangle. So just draw a rectangle on your sheet. But I'd like you to notice something that while the left and right sides are vertical, the top, the roof, has a slight slope to it. It's in perspective. You can eyeball that line, or you can use your pencil to help you. Bottom has a slight slope to it, too. Something to notice about this, we're outside the streets on a hill. So here is the level plane. You can tell by left and right, the bottom of the brick. That's level, but it starts to step down. And the entry level for this store 
is much higher than the entry level for that store. So we'll have to accommodate that. This is a dividing, somewhere around in here is where we're dividing it between the first and second floor. This is the first floor and that's the second floor. It looks like it's a little more than half up. I can draw some light lines. You'll see when I'm blocking out my drawing, I'm holding my pencil back. I don't want to choke on it. I want to be able to sort of work from my elbow or my shoulder. So we have that. Now let's get this rectangle. It's not as wide and it comes up about two thirds of the way. So it comes up about two thirds of the way, not quite as raw, wide. So do remember that we're going to come down a little because the sort of stair steps down the street and our sidewalk will just be a sloping line. So we have this funny rectangle and that funny rectangle. This slope of the roof doesn't quite match that slope. So we'll find our pencil and to help us locate that slope. This roof edge comes out farther than that roof edge, but because of the angle, we can't tell. So it looks like one straight line. The one giveaway is when we get to the shadows. There's a line here that is cast by, it's a shadow cast by the edge of the roof eave here but it extends down much farther because that balcony has a roof covering. So while we can't see it up here at the roof line, we're definitely able to get an idea that there's a balcony covering there. We can tell by the shadow. Now we can see that there's a shadow cast by the balcony itself and a little bit by the railing. I'm just noticing that right now, and that'll be a very interesting part of our sketch, though we'll have to keep it kind of light. So while this balcony looks like it's about half the width of the upper floor. It's set over a little bit. I'll come over, I'll make a line. I'll come over and make a line a little more than halfway over. I think I'll go ahead and, and just estimate where that window goes. I'll put this big door underneath here. This is a fascinating window. It's got almost like a box underneath it. It's got wrought iron grill around it. Looks like the glass is in line with the wall. It's got this cool little covering, though it's pretty washed out just the way the sun is hitting it, so we can't quite tell what's happening there. So lots of stuff going on. I'll make some vertical lines just to remind myself when we get back to it that it's like a white a wrought iron box, a metal, metal box. Now let's erase a couple of these lines. They're not there and they're just confusing us for a moment. I think this goes out a little farther than I have it. You can see the top of that roof on the left. Oops, and I'm making that go out a little too far. All right, let's see if we can't put in some of the pieces here. I'm just comparing the tops of the windows. 
this steps down a little, door steps down quite a bit. All right, so looking at this, maybe make up a, a line in the middle of your rectangle there on the left. Let's look at these three guys up here. So that line in the middle will help us locate that first bracket. It looks like a Roman numeral number two. <laughs> on the right hand side is another one of those bracket. On the left hand side is the third bracket. That helps us uh, locate, locate the windows underneath once we get those located. So starting at the center bracket, the left-hand side of the center bracket seems to be the right-hand side of that window on the left. And see where the window is in there, and the wrought iron sticks out a little farther. So get the window there, the wrought iron there. Move it quite a bit lower. A lot of this, uh, a lot of this sketch is going to be comparing bits and pieces back and forth, which is how a lot of our sketches, if not all of your sketches, would be done. Is you're comparing one thing to another to get the scale right. For example, I don't. I feel like I don't have this window over scooted over quite far enough. And the side of that little stucco base is awfully thin. So my first time I drew it, I'd, I'd drawn it a little, a little bigger than I needed to. All right. From here, let's get the center window in there. It's coming off about here. And the door, looks like the left-hand side of the door is just about in the middle of these two. In there. As I said, it's nice to start in pencil so you can you can correct yourself when you see there's things that your proportions don't quite look right. Now let's erase some of these lines again just to check our proportions. We can decide how much of this building we, we want to draw on the right, um, excuse me, on the left. See how I drew this sloping down? But then look at our drawing. It's actually sloping the other direction. A bit of an optical illusion. And let what was happening at the bottom of this get the better of me. Boy, that side of the building is very much in it foreshortened.
Right, we have really ignored our balcony here. One of the more charming aspects of this building. Put our railing in. We've got a beam up top there. Not all the way up top. We can see some of those big rafter tails. She has five of them. So one goes in the middle. And one at either end and one in between. So one in the middle, either end, and divide it. And then this beam, it's got, looks like it has some decorat decorative shaping at the end. These posts, wrought iron support. A little bit of interesting curvature, for lack of a better term. There are seven rafter tails, or seven beams projecting out, cantilevering out from the face of that building. That's nice for us because that means there's one right in the middle. There's one at either end. It's easier to space an odd number. And then infill two here and two here, as you can eyeball. And those are the beams cantilevering out to support that balcony. You can just see the sides of them a little bit. All right. There's going to be some skinny little um, pickets, balustrade. And how about that door? Pretty much, it's not quite center on that center post. A little bit off. There we can see it. This big door has a door in the middle and two side lights. You want to put the little sign there? And look at this really cool light fixture. The bottom of it's about even with the top of the door. Doesn't stick out very far. I did anything. It's that we didn't, is that we have our, our roof over here a little high. And I think what we did is we didn't take into consideration the thickness of the tile, that there's a beam underneath it. Then we have our brackets. So I'm lowering that whole configuration a little bit. So top of that's just a little bit above the floor. It's a little bit above this. Top of this is equal with the steps. Okay, there's one. There are two steps there. That wire. Seems a little low. Let's get that a little higher. All right. You see a little 
A little planter box over here. Okay, let me put that in. See some bay windows here. See some lines in the sidewalk. You know, that's going to help us a little bit. I didn't want to talk too much about perspective in this one, but these lines in the sidewalk are leaning back, going back to a vanishing point. I think it's safe for us to eyeball. There will be a tree. There's a tree here, but I think in our drawing, we'd like to draw a much larger tree, something that looks like a eucalyptus tree since we're in Rancho Santa Fe. And part of the reason for Rancho Santa Fe to be was that it was a eucalyptus grove. And they were hoping that the, the fast-growing eucalyptus trees might provide lumber for railroad, railroad ties. And then while we're here, we can add these things. Okay, so there's four rafter tails that we can see. There's one, two, three, four, five spaces, though. So the thing to do is find your center. That'll end. That'll be our space, put a rafter tail on either side of it, and another one on splitting the difference. And so there's your there are your, your rafter tails. If you'd like to take a moment and use your kneaded eraser and lift off some of the pencil, you can. Now would be a good time. The pencil helped us confirm where everything goes before we start inking in. Pencil is, of course, not permanent, and we can erase it or, or lighten it as we're doing now. But once we get to inking, I'm kind of committed. I've always found mistakes in my inking a good way to add some character and some fun. All right, let's get started. Let's start with this portion. Now. This is a, a building with softer edges. It's not like some of the modern buildings we see today, um, the, the Spanish colonial revival style used slightly rounded corners and were um, they were built by hand. They look like they were built by hand, uh, but by skilled laborers. So the point I'm, I'm getting at is I, uh, a lot of these lines the edges of the buildings, let's dash them in because uh, they're the way the light's hitting them is they're a little softer. It's a good way to start um, any of your ink drawings is just dashing your lines in until you're certain, unless you're certain that it's a it's it's a line that you want to draw solid. So so this line I just drew solid because I can see that's that wood at the at the eave and the rafter tails I can make with a solid line. The roof tiles are not flat. They're actually half rounds shaped like this. And underneath them, and you can just I don't know if you can see, but you can see just barely here. There's one up on the top, one underneath it. So there are all these, they call these bottom ones pan tiles, and then these are the top ones. And a little bit in perspective. So when the rain hits, the water comes down in this portion. This keeps the rain out. 
Rain hits this, falls into this, and sacks like a little gutter, and out the water goes. They're very charming. So when we're drawing at the end there, we'd be keeping in mind that there's some the pan tiles underneath and then the round tiles up top. But we don't want to be too realistic about it. This is a sketch and it wants to have a looseness to it. So there's a randomness to them. We'll give it some character. And you can uh, color and shade in some of these half rounds. As you can see, the beam behind it, and so it makes it look like they're solid. All right, then we have these rafters. Go back a little. We have this beam that the rafters are sitting on. I might have made mine a little thick. A right iron column support with some little curly cues underneath them. You can make them with dots because <laughs> the scale is so small. I do these verticals with more of a flick because they're so thin. But look, periodically, there's a little something to it. And I want to catch that. You'll notice that so every other balustrade has something attached to it. But the first one it's right in the middle, and you go over two, and it's top and bottom. And I'm going to make it just a dot, because that's all I know about it. And at this scale, I don't want to get that uh, much fussier than that. But I want to give a hint, because it's kind of cool. Those cantilevered beam ends are next. They're just little rectangles. You're seeing just a slight bit of the sides of those, those cantilever beams. This window is a casement window with two sashes. A casement window is the kind that swings out, like doors swing out. And each of the sash is divided into three lights. Now let's draw in the door that's on that balcony. We have to look pretty closely to see it looks like a French door. That is, it's a wood frame with glass in the middle. And we have the upstairs. And that's all we need to do for the time being, like I said, until we get to the shade and shadow portion. You can see a little bit of a chimney up there. Might just be a vent stack. Chimney might be a lot taller. I'm, while I'm over here on this side, I've decided to, to um, hint in what's happening over this end of the roof as it overhangs is called the rake and so we'll draw in what we see of the rake. Not a perfectly straight line. We could draw on that cute little light. Just hints of it. Not too many lines. All right, how about the door? 
main door. Looks like I could make it a little taller than I had it in relation to the balcony above it. It's a very modern door, which I find a disappointment, frankly. It's all glass, appropriate for today's marketing and display needs, but not fitting with the architecture and not what Lillian Rice had originally designed. So I'm going to use my artist license and add some divided lights to give it some more character, give it some more character suitable for this building. Really cool herringbone pattern on the brick there. But I don't want to give too much away. I'm not even sure. Uh, it, you can see that at the corner there's horizontal brick. I'm not sure uh, giving much detail to it will say much about it. It might be kind of confusing. Like, what in the world is that? So I've given a hint. Hopefully, It'll be self-explanatory to the viewer. Remember, there's not much to see up here because of the way the sun is washing it out. Let me give just a little hint at the little upward curve of that eyebrow. And then for lack of a better word, I'll do this the cage, the rot wrought iron around that display window. Looks like there's three bars. One's right in the middle, another one up top, and the bottom. And I'm, I can't quite see how many verticals, so I'm just going to, to draw on something like that and give it it's sort of an etc, etc. I'm not giving it much detail because I can't tell what's happening. There is a window back there, and we can draw that. What next? Should we do the beam and the brackets? Now that we've lowered them a bit. I keep looking back at the building and then at my drawing and the building and my drawing and just see how I'm doing. You want to see what other details that you might see. And seeing that you can really see that these are two separate uh, little brackets. But when you see the far one on the left, it looks like it's all one. We see more of this roof, but it's the same principle. They're little half rounds, but they're at an angle, and so they're more like half ovals. This is the part where it can really give your drawing some character. You can see the sides of the tile. But we don't want to draw every one. Maybe some at the beginning, some on the left, some on the right. You'll get a feel for how much is the right amount. This has got a lot of contrast between the edge of that wall and what's happening behind, so I don't have any qualms about drawing it in solid. I hadn't picked up that planter before. I might do it now. I could ignore it if I wanted to, but... Little vine. Okay, how about this window? And its eyebrow. You see a little bit more of it. The sun is catching it, and the over the roof is casting a bit of a shadow. 
Let's add this wrought iron grill in front of the window. These are not actually part of Lillian's original design. They were added sometime or, uh, before 1991 and have since been removed, actually. She might have found these grills a little too fussy. She had a three-sided bay window and the frame around the window is all wood, which would be more in keeping with her vision for a Southern California architectural style. You can see in this door, how you can see its edge here in the top, you see two lines. We're actually seeing the thickness of the wall there. You see that which is the corner of the stucco. This line is where that stucco turned in and hit the door itself. Because of the angle, we only see the line of the stucco. We don't see the other side of the door. It's hidden. Adding the steps now. And then I add that next little planter. I hadn't thought about doing it before. I guess I hadn't thought about it, but it looks like I've added all three of those. And that's what you get to decide is your sketching. What would you like to include in your sketch and what would you like to leave out? A little sign above the door. There's a whole stucco um, surround there, but it's so subtle, I'm going to ignore it. More grill work. As I'd said, these weren't original and have since been removed, but the old wooden windows didn't come back. Instead, frameless glass was installed to better view the merchandise, presumably. But in defense of the frameless glass, a preservation architect may prefer the clean glass as there's no way you would confuse it with the original. There's no false sense of history given. All right, now this portion over here, we get our little roof. You can see the ridge tiles. Each sketcher is different and you may decide to go with less detail up here. But um, as I've said, I find the roof tiles one place to give my sketch character and charm. These are getting farther away, so we don't have as much definition on the tiles. We can see the tiles around on this upper roof. It's on the building behind. Objects in the distance will be lighter, sketchier, much less detailed. So that section of the building, we just don't want to emphasize too much. Let's ink in the curve in front. Remember how I had the line sloping the other way? My head knew that the sidewalk slopes to the left, but I needed my eyes to see how it really appears in real life. And on our drawing, it's lower on the right. I'm adding some hints of detail in that little alcove to the left of the building. It, it also wants to be just a suggestion. It's not the important part of the building. Let's add some last few details before we get to the shadows. You know what we haven't done yet is to lay out our shadows that are cast on the walls. And we want to do that in pencil. If drawing on location, these shadows will have moved on us by now. But they're fixed in the photo, and so we could draw the shadows in at any time. Let's take our kneaded erasers, or just a regular eraser if you don't have a kneaded eraser, and lightly erase our pencil lines. This is going to help us uh, see how our drawing is reading. I want to see how our sketch is reading and, and what elements. 
did we need to draw in? What did we erase? I think we started to erase some of these lines. And I can see that we missed a bunch of lines over here. There's a little roof going off that we forgot to draw in. End of the building. Barely you can see the window. All right, so let's just lightly use the pencil and find out where the shadow lines go. It's a very uneven line cast by the eave, and it's because the tiles stick out and give it a lot of character. All right, let's see where the, the shadow is being cast from this balcony roof covering. This whole side's going to be in shadow. And don't you love this? I don't know if we're going to be able to pull that off. So you can see all these things in shadow. We'll have to experiment. Those are our shadow lines, at least the ones that we'll start with. There are many ways to draw shadows, but we're going to start with a series of cross hatches or diagonal lines. They're sort of uniform lines like that. A couple can go long because tiles go long. Now would be a fine place if you wanted to color in that beam there. And then we can continue with our shadow. We'll go right over the door, but don't go over this column that's in front. And you can make Sort of a dash line for the railings, the shadows on the railings and the balustrades. Go ahead and just do your shadows right over the door because where the doors are, we're going to give them a little extra punch. They get more shadow. And if they're looking a little too uniform, you can put in an occasional line that's not parallel to those others. This whole side of the building is in shadow. Planter box is not. There's some shadows on the ground. Those are horizontal. I'm going to go ahead and just put everything over here on this side in shadow. There's more, more dark shade and shadow and definition happening underneath this balcony. So go ahead and give it a little more intensity. Then let's go back in because clearly our door up here is a lot darker than, than what we've got it um, shaded at. So while some of it is shadow, some of it is tonal value. And if you want to make the rafter tails darker. Now would be a good time. 
and I can see that there's some things happening around the corner here, so you can add a few things there. A lot of crazy electrical wires. We're going to ignore those. This ocean has a lot of tonal value. There's a lot of dark at the end of uh, the tiles here at the eave. Finish those with some dark, and then let's get our shadows going. Okay, this time I'm not making them all go perfectly parallel. Maybe about every fourth or fifth crosses itself, crosses the others. I love this window. You can see the sides of the Awfully confusing what's happening on these down below, but all I can say is uh, I can see this door has a shadow because it's deeper. It's got a shadow there on the top and on the left, and then where the stucco turns a little lighter. That window has got a similar kind of shadow up top, and then just a couple of diagonal lines because when we're indicating glazing, we'll indicate glazing with some diagonal lines. Same with these windows in here. I'm not putting as much shade and shadow on the window frame, just where the glass is. And then stand back and, and squint a little and see if it's reading. Um, I feel like these brackets need a little more. You know, there's more shadow up there closer to the to the roof, so if you wanted to darken it just a bit, you could. If you wanted to add a little more definition, um, tonal value to your brackets, you can. Feel like that white spot on the the roof is distracting. Go ahead and give it a little punch. How's it reading so far? I think the side of this could use a little color. I see some shadows coming off of these bars, and of course, there's a little shadow here from the eyebrow. Same here. There's a little shadow coming off of it. As I carefully draw the shadows for these bars, and you see I'm just dotting them in, I, I realize I'm, I might be getting a little fussy with the sketch, but, but with this kind of architecture, sometimes it's the shadows that tell the story. We can't see the bars, but we can see the shadows. We can't see the roof overhang, but the shadows tell us how far out it goes. We'll do the same here. Darken in the area where the glass is, but not where the window frame is itself. And then darker up at the top and on this left side. Because the window frame itself is casting a little bit of shadow on the glass. Feel like adding a little more pattern to your brick, you can. It's interesting that Lillian Rice added that brick wainscoting at all. It's it's not typical of this style of architecture, but she must have felt it the building needed it. Shading in that entry door, if you divided if you created the divided lights, just shade them in in the individual 
rectangles, but don't shade in the frame. And then I'm just going to darken in left side and top, and then diagonal lines. It really is all dark. Well, maybe I'll go back in and just pinch it in. Then um, squint, see how it's looking. Right. Some instructors tell me you hold up your drawing to a mirror and look at it in reverse and see how it looks to you. We're not going to do that. <laughs> you can tell. By drawing this way, there's an awful lot of character that's coming, that's, that's being added into your sketch that hints at the character of the building. There's so much character and charm in the building that it's itself, and your sketch has a lot of character too. That's why we were a little looser with the, um, the cross-hatching on our shadows. It's sort of fun and playful. And so is our building. Okay, let's get some shadow over here. It's like a little hallway. Not exactly sure where it leads to, but it helps give some definition uh, to the edge of that building, doesn't it? Looks like it's all landscaping. So I'll just scribble in what I see are plants. What will help us in the foreground, now we could draw this shadow. Mm, I think what I'd like to do is maybe just some really quick light lines. Quick lines to suggest that it's a walkway and something similar in the road. By moving your pen quickly here, your lines will come out real sketchy, which makes them less important, which is what we're after. Adding some vertical lines on the face of that curb help to, helps the curb to read as a vertical surface, and it makes it stand out differently from those all those flat areas there. Some of these lines you can just draw some random horizontal lines. It's just suggesting that maybe there's more shadow over there. Or maybe it's just part of your composition. If you're ready, we can do the tree now. Let's do two layers of trees. Let's do one layer of tree that would be here that we're going to use to silhouette the edge of the building. So I've just drawn this random line, and then I'm just going to Cross hatch in. What I'd like it to do is to be is to be really in shadow and to give us a silhouette against the back of the building. That's a lot of ink. I may have put too much ink on this. I'd recommend in your sketch you keep this area maybe a little lighter. Don't follow what I'm doing here. In hindsight, this area is getting a little muddy and confusing with all this ink. Now those eucalyptus trees have sort of a, almost a, they're not exactly like weeping willows, but they, they do have a vertical, so some eucalyptus trees, there's something like 300 different varieties. 
I always think of them as, as sort of a little bit willowy. Some branches are here. And then maybe where the tops of the branches are, we put a little shade shading in. But for the most part, this tree, and we're making it up, so we can kind of do what we want to, but um, more sun is hitting it, at least in our version. But there will be areas within the center of the tree that have a little shadow. That's our tree. The last thing is to remind yourself where you were. You were in Rancho Santa Fe. You could write that you were on the corner of La Granada and Paseo de Lucias, or in front of the old store. And then write the date. From a technical standpoint, this view wasn't too tricky or outside the basics, but hopefully you got an appreciation for this particular style of architecture, its proportions and unique elements, and that you had fun getting to know one of California's earliest lady architects. Well done, everyone!